This is Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. There is a war out there for the hearts, minds, wallets, and votes of the American people. Climate change is one of the main fronts. Is climate change real? What is the time frame in which we will see significant change? What is the future impact on gardening in Lane County and the Willamette Valley? Today's guest studied science at MIT in the 1970s when early climate data like Antarctic ice cores were being reviewed. Joe Tyndall is the author of the soon to be published book, Beyond the Tipping Point. Welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. <laughs> A very important subject that we need to talk about and I think that people are interested regardless of where they fall on the spectrum of belief or disbelief. So the first question is, no matter what you reply, I think someone will disagree, uh, but is climate change real? Well, I think it is, and I think that the data that we've collected does indicate that it is real. So I pulled a bunch of slides out of the book. The, the book has a lot of il illustrations in it, so we may as well go and just grab the first one and, mm -hmm. and start talking about that. Okay. So, for slide, please, there we go. Okay, that is a picture of commercial shipping across the Arctic. You can now take uh, cargo uh, from through the Bering Strait, uh, either along the coast of Russia or the coast of Alaska and Canada, down to Europe. This is the first time that we've been able to do that in 12 million years. And it's happening at the end of every summer and early fall. Uh, you can have pictures like this. Uh, and there's lots of people sailing through the Arctic just because that's their thing that they're doing. Lots of internet stories. So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is uh, one of the charts from the Berkeley Climate Study. What they did, um, uh, I guess it's um, Pro Professor Mueller, I think is how you pronounce his name, was a climate skeptic. And so the Koch brothers actually dropped $750,000, which was a big chunk of their funding. And they went out and took 9 billion average daily temperature readings and did a statistical analysis on them. And this is what they found. And, and this was led by Dr. Mueller, who was the, the climate scientist skeptic. Skeptic, yes. Yeah. And so what he did, okay, so we'll pull the slide back up. Yeah, what he, what you can, you, okay. A couple of things. You can see some interesting stuff on it. The uncertainty in the early days, um, you notice the, the wide bands because there's less uh, climate stations. Um, there's an interesting graphic on the website that showed that's one frame of video for every year from 1750 on. And so in 1750, there's only a few white dots on it indicating where the, the weather stations were. And by today, you know, the, the whole planet is covered. I mean, there's weather stations everywhere. So you can see that the uncertainty goes down as we get closer to the future. Um, and looking from essentially that last little rise is a one degree centigrade increase that has occurred over roughly 40 years. So that's about 2.5 hundredths of a degree per year. It's not a very large change, but if you keep doing that every year, things get warmer. So about a, about a one degree rise since uh, the 1970s. Okay, uh, let's go to the next one. Um, we can also get a temperature history. It turns out that there are three stable isotopes of oxygen, oxygen 16, 17, and 18. Now, oxygen 18 will evaporate. The colder the water, the less oxygen 18 evaporates. S but the ratio changes. In other words, the ratio of oxygen 16 to 18 evaporated as the temperature goes up, uh, uh, the oxygen 18 increases. So we can um, so we can get a record in ice cores or in sediments and if there's more oxygen 18 then it was warmer and if there's less then it was cooler. And the reverse is true of deep ocean sediments because calcium carbonate shells uh, made by marine creatures will include um, more oxygen 18 if the water is colder and less if it's warmer. So the two, the ice cores, the surface sediments versus the, the deep sea sediments uh, have an inverse relationship so you can correlate them and check them. And so this is a history of 65 million years of ice core data, or not ice core, of sedimentary data giving us temperature back to when the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs hit the planet. And so um, the latest 
you can know, you see how it's getting noisier as we get as we get to the later years, and that's because we've been bouncing in and out of ice ages. So we actually have very good temperature data uh, all the way through the entire history of the the planet uh, due to this oxygen 16, oxygen 18 thing. Um, and the thing that's important to note is that little section in the upper left-hand corner where it says PETM. That is the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Uh, what happened was some volcanic activity destabilized what's called a clath rate at the bottom of the ocean, putting a big burst of methane into the atmosphere, and it heated the planet by a couple of degrees, and it lasted about 200,000 years. Uh, we'll talk about the PM, uh, PETM event later. So let's move on to the next, uh, or actually before we move on, um, one of the things that you can see on here is you go back about 12 million years in Antarctica glaciage. You go back to, I guess it's uh, about 25 million years ago, and Antarctica was ice free, um, and then it glaciated, or, okay, glaciated for the last 12 million, then it was f ice free for about 12 million, then it glaciated again, and then it was ice free f going further back in history. So, um, and that, yeah, good enough. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, the surface temperature of the planet is actually set by four uh, factors. The out output of the sun, which is fairly constant. Um, it varies a little bit, but not a whole lot. There's a sunspot cycle, but that's only a few uh, tenths of a degree uh, or tenths of a percent change in the, in the output of the sun. It doesn't change very much, so it's roughly constant. Our distance to the sun changes. Uh, we're on an elliptic orbit, so over the course of the year, we get closer and further away from the sun. But in the longer term, our orbit changes a little bit. It gets a little more elliptic, a little bit less elliptic. Uh, the tilt of the Earth changes a little bit to conserve uh, what's called angular momentum. And, but in the, in the short term, in the, in the course of a human lifetime or a century, uh, our distance to the sun is essentially constant. The two factors that really change are the absorption of sunlight by the Earth, uh, that's called albedo. And then the other one is the effect as we try to re-radiate energy back out into space, how much of that is captured by the uh, trace gases in the atmosphere. Let's do the next slide. Uh, so we have 174 petawatts coming in from the sun. That can either be calculated or measured, and NASA's measured it very accurately. Uh, a petawatt is a one followed by 15 zeros. You're probably familiar with a kilowatt uh, from your electric bill. But uh, this is a, a petawatt, 174 coming in. Now, pre-industrial revolution, we had 174 petawatts that was going back out into space. Up until now, uh, we've been out of balance by about one petawatt due to deforestation and uh, burning carbon-based uh, fuels, from putting carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, but as soon as the Arctic becomes ice-free, we will add another petawatt of um, heating imbalance to the planet. So we'll have about a two petawatt difference in about a decade. Okay, next slide. So this is from the fifth IPCC report. And what they, the, there's a series of um, effects. Uh, the top one is carbon dioxide, then methane, and it goes down through the list, looking at the, what's putting our, car, our planet out of heating balance. And the total amount that they project at this point is about 2.3 watts per square meter. If what we do is we multiply that times the surface area of the Earth, we come out with 1.17 petawatts, which is the current heating imbalance. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, the first person to uh, ask the question in the modern scientific literature of what set the surface temperature of the planet was in 1824, that was Joseph Fourier. Now, at the time, he did not have enough physics to be able to do any calculations regarding it, but his um, speculation on the situation was essentially correct. Over the 1800s, we developed that physics. Uh, the next uh, character is John Tyndall, uh, no relation. Um, oh, come on. He's a great-great-grandfather, right? Uh, something like that. Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, if, you go, if you go to the western part of England and parts of Ireland, there's, you can walk down a street and every mailbox says Tyndall on uh, it. Okay. Okay. So there were, there's lots of us in, in strange places. <laughs> but um, he measured the absorption of different wavelengths of light and infrared radiation in uh, gases, carbon dioxide, 
uh, water vapor, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. And so did all of that work during the mid-1800s. Then in 1865, uh, uh, James Kirk, Kirk Maxwell uh, sort of combined a bunch of physical physics that had been done prior into Maxwell's equations and gave us a, 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 a complete theory of electromagnetic uh, radiation, which talks about heat and light and radio and television and electronics and a lot of that kind of stuff there. Uh, the next one is uh, Joseph Stefan, who came up with that. Uh, there's two equations on the page, and he came up with the first one, which says that the amount of power radiated by a warm body is equal to its air surface area times its emissivity, which is uh, a, we, can, we can derive emissivity from quantum mechanical uh, considerations, but it's usually just measured, uh, times a constant times temperature to the fourth power, and that's measured from absolute zero. Now, once we had that, we could then calculate the output of the sun uh, from knowing its surface temperature. We could also calculate the output of the earth. And that's where we get the 174 mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the from petawatts. the earth. Yeah. Exactly, the petawatts. <clears throat> so he, deri he derived it experimentally. And then um, Ludwig Volz Boltzmann, five years later, uh, derived it from uh, more fundamental physical principles, the same. Uh, so in other words, it's not, this is not a fundamental equation, um, a fundamental law, but it is derivable. And then the final character is Savant Uranius. And in 1896, after a very messy divorce, he disappeared for six months and actually calculated what, he, he derived this second formula, uh, which says that the forcing function, that's that 2.29, uh, watts per square meter that we saw on the IPCC report is equal to a constant times the natural log of the excess carbon dioxide divided by the background uh, carbon dioxide, which is 280 parts per million. And so <coughs> that, that equation is still in use today. And he calculated that if we doubled the carbon dioxide, we would get about a 10 and a half degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. But that doesn't include, of course, the effects of methane or deforestation or melting the um, Arctic ice. But it's a, it's a, a very useful equation. So f we've known the effect of carbon dioxide on the atmosphere pretty solidly for well over 100 years. OK, next slide. This is uh, derived from some work done by NASA that looks at where the incoming um, solar radiation goes and how it leaves the planet. Now, the big thick blue line rising up is the weather system. Uh, so there's an interaction. A lot of the sunlight is absorbed by the surface of the planet. Um, and then there's an interaction between the surface of the planet and the atmosphere. And then eventually it radiates back into space, except for currently that one petawatt and in a decade, the two petawatts. Um, you know, once the Arctic ice is gone, that is gradually heating the planet. Okay, next slide. Now, this is what the Arctic ice currently looks like on average um, in a year. You know, it, it varies from being less in the summer and more in the winter, but that's its average. Okay, next slide. That's what it looks like when the ice is gone, and the ice is going to be gone in about a decade. So. Um, that represents 4% of the face of the Earth. So you can take the 174 petawatts times 4%, and this is what the sun would see for about three months a year, so one quarter of a year. And if you just do the gazintas, currently with the ice there, it reflects about 85% of the sunlight coming in, and it will wind up absorbing about 70%. So if you do all the numbers, you wind up with about another petawatt of heating as a result of that when the Arctic ice is gone. OK, next slide. Um, this is a history, um, basically about 1,000 years. Uh, and you see that we were about 280 parts per million, pretty constant, uh, for, for most of uh, our up until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then suddenly we put a lot of uh, carbon into the air. Next slide. We've actually done eight, since the beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution, we have eight doubling periods. Every 32 years, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has doubled. So we've got perfect exponential growth in carbon di excess carbon dioxide for eight doubling periods. 
If we go another three doubling periods, we get up over 1,000 uh, parts per million. Okay? And there's enough carbon in terms of coal and oil in the ground for us to do this with no problem. So if we continue business as usual, we're going to heat the plant. We're going to put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Next, next slide. Okay, so in 1978, we put up a satellite. On, uh, because the, there had been a lot of discussion in the scientific community, um, one of the tasks was to measure the Arctic ice area. And so we have daily measurements of Arctic ice since 1978. And it's declined, the average has declined about 11.5%. And you might say, well, that's not very much. So let's look at the next slide. The problem that we have is that area is two-dimensional thinking. And the reality is that we're more concerned about volume. Now, the average volume over that period has declined by about half, and its minimum annual volume has declined by more than two-thirds. So if you're looking at area, you're doing two-dimensional thinking, and volume's what we should be looking at. Now, the area data is found often discussed, but the volume data is not. Okay, next slide. Okay, so if we take the trend lines, and we are interested in a curve for a couple of reasons. Number one is because the forcing function is increasing as we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the heating function. Uh, the second thing is that we're seeing positive feedback mechanisms keep, uh, uh, kick in, which are causing the uh, heating to accelerate. Now, if we simply take the minimums, um, annual, so that what you see there is the maximum yearly trend, the average, average, and the minimum. If we take the minimums, we're going to hit zero in September of 2016, so a year, a year and a half from now. It may be a year later, or could, could even be this year, potentially. Uh, it's possible, uh, though not likely for this year, probably in 16 or, or 2017. So for a few days in September, the Arctic will be completely ice-free. Next slide. If we look at the maximum, it's going to um, uh, hit zero in about uh, 2030. And however, there are more positive feedback mechanisms that are accelerating things. Um, there's now currently more than 30 of them in the scientific literature that are being studied. Uh, a positive feedback mechanism would be, for example, when the ice is gone in the Arctic, uh, the Arctic becomes a solar collector, so that's going to cause heating faster. In other words, the ice is melted, so now um, it's going to collect more heat, and so it's going to melt faster. But there's more than 30 mechanisms that are being studied, all of which will accelerate the rate at which climate change happens. So we're probably likely to see the ice disappear by about 2025. And that's year-round, permanently, ice-free. Sail a boat from the Bering Strait right over the North Pole all the way down to Europe, no ice cubes in the way. Even in winter? All, all year, um, 365 days a year. Okay, next slide. So the actual way that the volume data is computed is that the satellites measure thickness, and they can do that by bouncing a radar beam off the top of the ice, and the fact that the ice floats a little bit, uh, part of it floats above uh, water, allows us to do that measurement. We can, make, we can measure time differences very, very accurate, accurately. And since the, we can know where the satellite is to within a fraction of an inch at any moment and know where sea level should be, we can calculate the difference in the time that it takes for the radar to hit the surface of the ice and come back versus if it were hitting open water. And so um, the volume data is done by looking at the area and you know, taking small segments or you know, uh, area, uh, you know, cells of it. That's what I'm looking for. Small cells, and then multiplying the area of the ice times its thickness, and then adding it all up. Well, what we've done here is exactly the reverse. We've taken the volume data um, and divided it by area, which gives us thickness. And that red line is three feet, um, and so. The thickness is declining four times faster than volume. Or, I'm, yeah, thickness is declining four times faster than area. So what's going to happen is the area is going to stay large until it sort of thins to nothing and then just disappears. So that's how it's going to go. Next slide. So 
We only have the satellite data back to 1978, so the question is what was happening before. And nuclear submarines have gone onto the Arctic since August 1958, and they've done it a lot, and they've taken ice measurements along the path. Now, the Nautilus was the first submarine that went underneath. Um, at the time that they went, the, the Bering Strait was almost blocked by ice. It, their first attempt to go under the ice uh, in the Bering Strait failed because the ice was so thick. It was about 60 feet thick in one area. Um, so they, they found a second channel to go, to go underneath and were successful on their second attempt. By 1970, there was no longer a problem going through the uh, uh, Bering Strait. Even, um, you know, the Nautilus went in August and it was iced over, but at, by 1970, year-round you could go through the uh, Bering Strait under the ice with no problem. And the Navy said, mm, maybe we should look at this. Hmm. And so they sent the queen fish along exactly the same path uh, 12 years later at the same time of the year, took the same measurements. And next slide. <coughs> we see that the Nautilus measured about a little more than 10 feet, um, and the queenfish measured uh, a little bit more than 7 feet. So the thing is that it had declined by almost 3 feet of thickness over a 12-year period. And as you can see, if we chart those two, it should be um, clear in about uh, 2012. <coughs> Excuse me. So, but we don't know whether 1958 or 1970 were above or below average thickness years. If you remember back to the area and volume data, uh, there's a lot of variation from year to year. The edges of the curves are kind of um, jagged. Okay, so let's move on. So what, we, what I did here is I took the satellite data for August and charted it. So each month of August, I averaged the, the measurements. Uh, for uh, thickness, went through, got the area, got the volume, did the division, took the thickness measurements, and that's that curve that you see there. And I took the largest deviation over that period, 35 years, and added and subtracted it from the submarine data. And that gives you that gray area, and of course the, the satellite data fits right inside it very nicely, indicating that uh, you know, our analysis is, is pretty much correct. Um, so, next slide. Now, what I then did was took and uh, did a straight line uh, regression um, in, of not only the August data, uh, satellite data, but the two points from the Nautilus and the Queen fish. And you can see that 1958, the ice was a little thicker than average, and in 1970, it was a little bit thinner. But that's, that gives us a trend line. And you notice how the um, August data is curving downward. That's due to a greater forcing function and positive feedback kicking in. So the Arctic ice was melting very thoroughly in the 1960s when the concentration of CO2 was about 320 parts per million. So when did it actually start melting? Probably around 1920 when um, atmospheric CO2 was only 300 parts per million. So we have a lot of people out there talking about uh, if we get below 350, we can save the planet. Uh-uh. If, if, if the Arctic was melting at 320, getting back to 350 is meaningless. Okay? Yeah. So it was probably melting at 300. Was the real number 297? Was it 305? I don't know. It's probably around 300 when we hit the tipping point and we started the planet into changing its climate state um, from the current interglacial to some warmer condition. It would have taken longer for it to occur if it was only at 300, but we were basically being kicked out of the interglacial climate state. Okay, so let's move on. So just a, a quick diagram. The thing that's melting the ice is warmer water coming through the Bering Strait. There's about 800,000 cubic meters per second flowing from the Pacific okay, to the, um, into the Arctic, and that's care, if you go back to that, uh, well, don't go back on the slides, but if you remember back to the uh, slide from the Berkeley Climate Study, that water is about one degree centigrade warmer than it was, um, you know, about 40 years ago, and that carries enough energy to melt the ice, so that's where the ice is melting is coming from. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are the currents. 
Uh, and you can see uh, around the Bering Strait uh, what's called the Alaska Current, which circulates counterclockwise. And the last couple of years, it's actually had cold, cooler than average water passing past the Bering Strait to go into the Arctic. There's a big blob of warm water that's on its way uh, up to the Arctic, uh, or up to the Bering Strait at this point. So this year is probably going to be a big melt. Uh, it may set, it's probably going to set the record, but we'll have to wait and see. Okay, next slide. So the problem that we have, there's two problems. One of them is um, the ice that sits on Greenland, when it melts, it's going to raise sea level. And uh, if we actually calculate, when the Arctic becomes ice-free and we have one more petawatt of energy that's dumped mostly in the Arctic, it's only going to take 25 years to melt the ice on Greenland. There's 684,000 cubic miles. So that's, that's 23 and a half feet. Okay, next slide. And if we look at Antarctica, uh, that ice is also melting. Now there's people who say, oh, well, Arctic, Antarctic ice is getting thicker. Because the climate is warmer, uh, the air holds more moisture and some of it does dump out onto uh, Antarctica. There are sections of Antarctica that are actually thickening. However, overall, Antarctica is thinning and those areas that are colored are likely to melt before the year 2100. So that's another 25 to 30 feet of sea level rise from there. So when, when Greenland goes, and when and those colored area in Antarctica grows, goes, we're going to be looking at pretty close to 50 feet of sea level rise. So could we see that by, the, by 2100 if positive feedback kicks in? Potentially, yes. Now, the interesting thing about the IPCC report is it does not include the models that they use to predict do not include positive feedback. Next slide. Okay, so Antarctica goes from, you know, covered with ice to that, and it's going to probably take about a thousand years uh, to melt it all. But at that point, sea level between um, melting all the ice and thermal expansion will rise about 300 feet. Next slide. So this is a map of the world. Um, those areas that are in light blue were dry land during the last ice age when sea level dropped about 400 and 25 feet to supply the mountains of ice that were sitting on top of uh, Europe, uh, the former Soviet Union, and uh, North America. And when the, all the ice on the planet melts, those red areas will be underwater. That includes the eastern, basically the entire eastern coast of the United States. Uh, it includes Los Angeles, it includes uh, San Francisco, uh, many, many uh, cities in China, uh, London is gone, um, so about half the world's population uh, currently lives in areas that will be flooded uh, at the, once all the ice has melted. Okay, next slide. The bigger problem is the fact that the weather system that carries rainwater, fresh water over the continents, uh, is driven by the temperature difference between uh, the equator and the Arctic. During an ice age, when the uh, average temperature at the Arctic is 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit colder, we have one single powerful convection cell. Currently in an interglacial, it's broken into three cells that carry energy from the equator up to the Arctic. And once that number, uh, that zero, uh, which is currently the average temperature in the Arctic, zero Fahrenheit, uh, once the water is melted and it's open water all the time, it can be no colder than about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, the system that drives the weather uh, will become weaker, and so there'll be a lot less water carried over the continents. Okay, uh, and it's going to mean essentially a mega drought, which is um, going to cause crop failures, uh, species extinctions, and starvation. I would like to just point out that uh, talk of mega drought has been in the media just in the last few days. Oh yeah, okay, and it's coming. Okay, let's move on to the next one. So we get into what's the impact going to be on human population. Uh, currently today, if you look around, somewhere between a million and two million people a year are dying as a result of climate change. All that stuff that's going on in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, is due to the fact that the rains have failed, 
the crops have failed, and what happens is when the food supply becomes a problem, you get into sectarian violence. All the little tribal chiefs take over and they start fighting each other for the remaining food. And so that's going on in Africa right now. Now we're denying that that's the cause. But the stuff that's happening in Syria is the same. In other words, Syria absorbed about a quarter of a million Palestinian refugees. It absorbed refugees from Iraq. It absorbed refugees from Afghanistan. And then it got into a drought, which caused a problem with the food supply, which meant that we got into, again, uh, warlords and sectarian violence. And now we have ISIS. Okay, so all that stuff that's going on in Syria is the direct consequences of ch climate change. One of the things that's happened is that almost nothing has been harvested in the northern third of Mexico in the last decade. So the subsistence farmers that used to live down there can't live anymore, which is one of the reasons why they're migrating into the United States. They can't live on the land anymore. So climate change is starting to cause migration. Once we get to the point where the Arctic is ice-free and the weather system shuts down, now the food supply for that's now, now this, the system that's supplying 7 billion people with food is going to have serious problems. So we're going to get into starvation and we are going to see a reduction in population. Now if what you do is you look at, at future studies that do not consider climate change. They say, yeah, we can sustain maybe two to four billion people on the planet without further environmental degradation. We can't supply, we're past the, we're past the, the carrying capacity as it stands right now. But if you look at studies that talk about climate change, they talk anywhere from less than a billion people by the end of this century, that's 80, 85 years from now, um, down to less than half a, half a billion, 500 million. And I've seen studies that go as low as projecting that our population may have dropped to as low as 35 million. So not good. I mean, I'm 62 years old. Um, I'll live to see, you know, that little peak, but I'm not going to live to see the major die-off where literally, uh, including the, you know, new people being born in the process, there's going to be about 10 billion people that will die prematurely over the coming century. Uh, it's pretty frightening, and uh, you know that's the reality. Let's go to the next slide. So just to summarize, we've been bouncing back and forth between um, interglacial periods and ice ages for the last few million years, originally on every 40,000 years, and then more recently about every 100,000 years. But we can't stay, if the Arctic ice is in place, we can stay uh, in an interglacial if we're down below about 300 parts per million. When the ice is gone, we have to be below 250 parts per million to refreeze the Arctic and stay in the interglacial period. Otherwise, we pop into a hotter temperature state. And we're going there whether we like it or not. And now the problem that we face is 500 parts per million. If we don't stay below 500 parts per million, we cannot stay in a PETM-like event. That's, you know, that's a whole bunch warmer than we're current, we currently are average temperature. But if we don't stay below 500, we have no idea where the planet will stabilize because it will change. You know, there will be positive feedback mechanisms um, that will put a lot of the carbon that's currently in the soil. In other words, um, at the end of the last ice age, the Sahara Desert was uh, a forest. And it, um, as you can actually see, as, as it was, um, uh, there's, there's more charts that I didn't include in this presentation, but you can actually see as the Sahara Desert turned into a, from a forest to a desert, that carbon made its way into the atmosphere. So in other words, it was rich soil with biomass on its surface, and now it's just sand. So where did that carbon go? It went into the atmosphere. And now as we begin to look at other places like all of the tropical forests, which may not survive, okay, that's going to go into the air too. So um, let's stop it here for a little while. I mean, we can come back and talk about some more of this uh, later. But that's, that's, the, that's the data. That's the physics. Um, you know, whether you like it or not, we put up a satellite um, and... Uh, yeah, can we get back to, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so we, we, put, we put a satellite uh, up in the air, 
are up in the sky, and we've been measuring this stuff. Uh, we go out and we field test to verify that the measurements made by the satellite are correct. Okay. The, these, this data is not in, you know, there's no contention about the data. It's been field verified. And so you can go up, you can get a plane ticket, you can go up and look at the Arctic right now and see what's going on there. There's no contention about the data. Uh, everyone yeah. knows that numbers don't lie. And yet, we have this huge argument in the world yep. about whether or not this is really happening and what on earth we should do about it. Right. Now, how do we explain this perplexing situation? Well, um, if, we look, if we look in the United States, we find three groups. Okay? And if you walked up to somebody with a microphone and you know, asked them about climate change, they'd say, leave me alone. And if you pressed them, they'd say, you know, you know, I don't have an opinion about that. That's not true. And if you press them some more, they'd say, well, I don't really know very much about that. And that is true. Okay? But if you press a little further, they will give you their opinion. And so people fall in three groups. They fall in the deniers, okay? They fall in a group I call the Al Gore crowd, which thinks that climate change is real, that human beings are causing it, uh, but that we have plenty of time, okay? It's still way in the future. We don't have to worry about it. Um, you know, we can just kind of tweak the marketplace a little bit and, um, you know, we can, we can make it go away by, you know, letting the marketplace solve it. And then there's group three who look at the data like I've been looking at it and say, we have a very serious problem here that we are totally in denial of. If you were to go to Europe or other places in the world, um, you would find that there's very few deniers. Um, there's a small population of Al Gore people, and then there's a large group who's saying, this is a serious problem, we gotta deal with it. So what's the difference between the United States and the rest of the world? The difference is that a substantial amount of money has been spent to generate deniers. And it's not just this one item. There's an entire system, and we can trace its origin back to August 23rd, 1971. If you look at what was happening then, uh, during the 1960s, the owning class, the ruling class in the United States kind of lost control of the society. We are the dominant country, you know, the one remaining superpower. What we do floods out into the rest of the world. And so during the 60s, we began to reevaluate a lot of things. Now, as, as you saw earlier in the presentation, the, there was, um, the scientific community had been discussing climate change for 150 years. Um, and but it was the 1960s when it became, uh, when, it, when it sort of made its way into the popular discussion, where we began to start talking about that. Mm -hmm. And now a number of things happen. I mean, if you look back, we have America's greatest generation. Uh, the men and women who ended fascism on two continents during World War II, my parents' generation. They hit middle age in the 1960s, and they looked around, and they saw all kinds of environmental degradation, um, they saw, you know, black men and women hanging from trees. You know, I can remember seeing photographs of lynchings in the newspaper, okay, during the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and, you know, people being beaten in the streets, the whole civil rights uh, thing. And they also saw uh, middle class kids coming back from foreign adventures in body bags. Now, if it was working class kids, who cares? Okay, you know, that's kind of America's attitude. But these are people who aspired to a better life. They're the people who used the GI Bill to go to college and became professionals, you know, and they had the house and the two cars and, and all of that. And they were, they were, you know, sort of saw themselves as getting out of the working class. And when their kids started coming back, that was a problem, you know, dead. And it wasn't just Vietnam. Uh, the Brookings Institute published a report in the mid 1970s called Force Without War where they listed the number they listed every incident where the United States landed its troops in another country and it turned out that from the armistice with Japan okay in 1945 to the Mayaguez incident which was Jerry Ford's little fiasco we landed our troops 215 times 
Okay, we invaded Peru. You know, there was stuff in Chile. There was the Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic. There was you know Nicaragua and Guatemala, and, it, and you know it just goes on and on. We landed them everywhere. Okay, and you know these bodies, these dead bodies, are trickling back from this. So as a result of those three things. My parents' generation elected the most progressive Congress that has ever existed, and they passed a lot of legislation. Um, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, uh, Toxic Substance Control Act, uh, Freedom of Information Act, War Powers Act, the list goes on and on and yeah. on and yeah. on and on. Okay? And every one of those laws reduced the rate at which rich people could extract wealth. And so, they eventually, you know, they were kind of in disarray. There's a lot of divisions in the, in the conservative world. You're talking about the rich people now. Well, rich people and conservatives. Mm -hmm. So what happened is in, on August 23, 1971, that's 59 days before Richard Nixon appointed him to the Supreme Court, Lewis Powell wrote a letter. It's 13 pages long. It's definitely worth reading. It was a manifesto where, I mean, it talks about how... Um, the liberals are poisoning the minds of our youth, and the best and brightest no longer want to be conservative businessmen. So we, as the responsible leaders of the society, must put aside our differences. We must pool a staggering amount of money, and we must change the way Americans think. And they started, so in the early 70s, we begin to see a lot of money flowing in, largely to Christian churches. What was Powell's position at the time he wrote that letter? What, what was, gave him any standing for people to pay was, attention to him? He was a corporate lawyer. He sat on the board of directors of 11 Fortune 500 companies, and he was the corporate counsel to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so he wrote that letter. Okay. And so in it, he recommends there's a whole series of activities, you know, action items, and all of them were done, every single one of them. But the two big ones <coughs> were funding corporate think tanks. And we know who these think tanks are, the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the Project for a New American Century, the list goes on and on. There's about 50 of them with a budget in excess of about $10 million a year. So that's, that's between half a billion and a billion dollars funded for that. There's another 200 of them okay, with a budget between $1 and $10 million a year. Now, these are not like industry things, like the dairy, the dairy Council or the Ag Council or, you know, the oil industry lobby groups, those kinds of things. These are in, in addition. These are just general purpose, create conservative mythology kinds of groups. Uh, another example is the Franklin Institute. It happens to sit in Toronto, which is convenient because if you're trying to uh, disrespect uh, the Canadian health system, you pump some money into... Um, the Franklin Institute, and they come out, I have a list of 500 people who are waiting for life-threatening, you know, whatever. And that kind of gag, you know, it plays in the, on the front pages of the corporate papers. Now, you then take that list, which is a public document. You call up all the people and you say, uh, what are you waiting for? Um, well, it's this elective surgery, yeah. Okay, do you like the fact you're waiting? No. Um, will you want to do something about it? No. Why? Because that means we would more, spend more money on our, um, our health system. Would you want to um, <coughs> trade the Canadian health system for the U.S. system? No. But that's the reality when you follow it up, and it never makes it to the news. But, you know, the, the Franklin Institute, you know, waving their list to people and making the claim makes it front page. You know, it's on Fox News, it's on NSNBC, etc. So that's kind of... The corporate think tanks um, do lobbying, they write legislation, they write books, um, they're the farm team for conservative pundits, that kind of thing. And it's being funded by corporate money. And the net result is that we're, um, we, we are feeding these ideas like um, social Darwinism and uh, Wild West capitalism and um, stern father pedagogy. We're pumping those ideas up and creating images that cause groups of people to vote conservative. So what we do is we, we, we put organizers into the Christians to get them vote, to vote, and we put uh, plants, agent provocateurs, into the liberal groups to get them not to vote, at which point the, um, the owning class can maintain the illusion that they have uh, control, and they proceed to write themselves tax cuts and get wealthier and 
um, deny climate change and do all the rest of this kind of stuff. Uh, I, I want to get back to what this means locally okay. and, and talking about time frames and you know what, what kinds of things can we expect locally. Okay. A hundred years from now, we will be on our way to looking like San Diego, okay, desert. Um, we have probably about 50 years that the current climate will work okay. Um, the Willamette Valley is very rich farmland, and we are growing grass seed. That's insane. Um, the San Joaquin Valley in California is having problems. People used to talk about how it was um, desalination. In other words, the mineral, the salts and minerals from the water being used for irrigation is just, you know, s causing salt, large amounts of sodium to be in the soil. And, you know, there's projected that that would, and it's growing. Now what's happening is the lack of water is drying out and the, uh, there's less ice pack in the, or snow pack in the Sierras, so there's storage problems. And under, uh, when Schwarzenegger was governor, they started building uh, reservoirs to try to catch that stuff so they could extend the useful life of the San Joaquin Valley, but it's drying out, okay? And so it's not, it's only gonna be a few years before it's gonna, its production is gonna go down. The breadbasket of the United States, um, the Midwest making, you know, growing wheat and corn, those crops are failing, okay? Which is why food prices have been rising in recent years. So, yeah, I mentioned earlier about mega drought being in the news recently. Yeah. Uh, they mentioned the Midwest and yeah. talking about 35, 40 year long droughts. Yep. Well, it's going to be, it's permanent. Yeah. Okay. So we have an opportunity in the Willamette Valley. There will be enough rain, you know, for the next 50 years for the Willamette Valley to be the breadbasket of the United States. Well, not so much wheat as growing all kinds of other things. And so there's people working on this. I mean, the Bean and Grain Project is an excellent example. Um, you know, the people involved in that, Harry McCormick and the others who've been pushing this, you know, are to be commended. It's trying to stop growing grass seed and, you know, grow staples, beans and grains and other foods. Uh, we have very rich soils. Uh, we have plenty of rain. Uh, so we have an opportunity here. Um, but you also have to consider that, you know, not only the Mexicans migrating to the United States because they can't live on their land anymore, but eventually, Los Angeles and San Diego, okay, are not going to have enough water um, to, to sustain their populations. And those people are going to start migrating. So this is an area that people are going to migrate to. So we're going to be looking at a lot of growth. We're going to have to think this stuff through because if we react to it without thinking it through beforehand, we're in trouble. So what kinds of things can we do? Start growing a garden in your backyard. Best thing you could possibly do, you know, convert the, your lawns. The victory garden model. Exactly. World War II, um, you know, a lot of the farmland was put under production to ship to, you know, to feed Great Britain and feed the war effort and soldiers and stuff. And so a lot of citizens grew, you know, because food became scarce in the United States, they grew their own food. We're going to have to go back to that. So losing your lawn. I mean, there's people out there. Uh, there's a permaculture community in the Eugene area. Um, one of the leaders in that is uh, Jan Spencer. Um, and he's been advocating for years for people to, you know, wipe out the lawns and, you know, grow tomatoes and carrots and sweet potatoes and collards and all kinds of good stuff. I mean, we, got, we, we have wonderful growing seasons here. And to a certain degree, we've got a benefit from uh, in winter. We have fairly mild winters. The pattern, <coughs> the, I've lived here for about eight years, and the pattern I've noticed is we have a nasty cold snap at the beginning of the year, and then it's fairly mild for the rest of it. You know, we'll get down below freezing, you know, maybe 25 or 30 nights a year, um, but not that far. We have a nasty cold snap, and then it's fairly mild. Uh, the summers are getting drier. Uh, they're getting hotter. Uh, last year, we set the record for days over 90 degrees. Um, the previous record had been 31. Last year we set 36. And we can expect to set those kinds of records year after year after year. It's going to get harder. Um, but gardening, um, you know, it's time to start building the soils. I mean, a lot of the soils around, we have a lot of clay. Um, and because there's so much, has historically been so much rain, a lot of the minerals have been leached out of it. 
So we need to be looking at rebuilding the soils. A lot of composting, you know, just collect those leaves and, you know, mulch them up, pile them on there, let them, uh, let them turn to rich, you know, soils. Um, and, and if we get, start getting a jump on this kind of thing where, you know, more and more backyards are converted to gardens and you, we start, you know, there's a joke out there that says, you know, when's the best time to plant fruit trees? Ten years ago. <laughs> okay. So, you know, now is the time that 10 years from now we're going to be saying, oops, there's a problem with the food supply worldwide. I mean, you know, this, the, the stuff that we're doing with supermarkets right now is just not sustainable. And so um, if people start planting uh, fruit trees, if they start planting perennials, if they start looking at, you know, some of the concepts, at a minimum, grow the sisters, you know, corn, squash, and beans, you know, the, 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 so now you've got the beans, which are fixing nitrogen in the soil. You've got a, a sort of a leafy vine plant on the bottom, which is keeping it from evaporating as much, the water from evaporating. And you've got this stalk of the corn that the beans can go up. Um, you know, it's not just that. It's, it, that's a good, a good start, but there's lots and lots of combination planting uh, that will uh, improve the soil. We've got, you know, looking at pest management, looking at a lot of things. I mean, one of the best things that could possibly happen is just getting more people into the master gardener stuff. I mean, one of the things is if you ask kids where does food come from, they say, well, the grocery store. Okay, they no longer realize. A hundred years ago, every kid knew how to, you know, grow food. They knew where it came from. They knew how to deal with chickens. They knew how to deal with all the rest of this stuff. But we have been separated from our food system for so long that a lot of the uh, knowledge that used to be common is no longer here. And it's we have to start putting it back in. Some gardening classes in schools would be just enormously useful. Um, but again, the Master Gardener program, you know, people go through, uh, what is it, 10 or 12 weeks of classes, you know, uh, one day a week, you spend the whole day there learning about, you know, composting and starting seeds and, you know, soil chemistry and a little bit about biology and so that you have some sense of, of what to do, how to grow food and what it means. I mean, that's, it's, it's, when, when the funding was cut a few years ago, um, it was, it was just magnificent that the community came in and made it continue because it's, it's essential. If it had disappeared, we would be in much worse shape than we currently are. And I would say that water conservation also is something that we need to rekindle yeah. efforts at. Uh, having potable running water in one's home, of course, is a fabulous thing, and yeah. I appreciate it as much as anybody mm -hmm. else. But I think it has also taught us not to fully appreciate water yeah. and to take it for granted. Yeah. And we need to learn how to conserve water every way we can, how to build yep. cisterns and reservoirs and um, do everything we can to use it frugally and, and efficiently mm -hmm. so that when, when the rains begin to slow down that we yeah. won't be left high and dry. <laughs> yeah. So we have time, you know, in this area we have time um, that we don't want to procrastinate anymore because we've already, you know, mm. kind of kind of wasted the time to procrastinate. But we're still going to have good rainfall for probably another 50 years. It's going to taper off, uh, but this is an area that's going to that's going to see a fair amount of rainfall. But the thing is, it's going to be concentrated more in the winter with longer drying dry summers. Yeah. So water storage becomes a problem. Exactly. Now the question is, how do you store water? Um, you know. There's expensive tanks that you could that you could do, but you know there's some expensive swimming pools. Mm -hmm. I mean the sort of Walmart special three hundred dollar, you know. So put a put a swimming pool, cover it as long as it's not getting any light. You're not going to get stuff growing in it. Um, but yeah, you could you could put in you know a section um, where you run the water off the roof during the winter, and then you water your garden with it during the summer. That's talking about Jan Spencer. Uh, he has, uh, what is it, a, a 6,000 gallon and two, three, uh, two, two 3,000 gallon um, containers in his yard. And that's enough for him to, during the winter, he runs the water off the roof, uh, fills them up, and then uses that water over the summer to, uh, to garden. For irrigation. Exactly. Yeah, I, I know others who have 
-hmm. Similar, you know, it's a variation on that theme of yeah. water storage that they then use during the summer for irrigation. Now's the time, a little bit at a time, to, mm -hmm. to begin to do those kind, to set those kinds of systems up. Mm -hmm. Other things that we can do is we can learn to cooperate with each other, in the sense that you could you could map your neighborhood with who has tools you know this house has got a couple of rakes this one's got some shovels this guy's got a table saw this guy's got a what whatever and you could actually share resources across uh, a neighborhood um, community gardens there's lots of places um, there's empty lots all over the place that could be converted to community gardens um, the sooner we get on to those kinds of things the less abrupt and and disruptive the transition will be um, so, you know, there is going to be a population die-off, whether we like it or not, and there is going to be fighting over resources. Um, but, you know, if, if this conversation is going on in this community and, and in other communities around the nation, we can get a jump on solving some of these problems before they become insurmountable, and they will. I mean, one of the things, in fact, uh, I'm on the police commission. And the reason that I got on the police commission was to say, this is coming up. Do I want the police shooting immigrants coming into this area because they're fleeing climate change? Okay. I mean, we're on our way to doing that. Okay. So my whole thing is to, is to say, well, we need to start changing the culture in the police so that it's less militarized and more service. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's... So that's one of the things I've chosen to do. Now, there's other people can find lots and lots of places to plug in, uh, but that's going to be, you know, what's our relationship to our neighbors? What's our relationship to the city? What's our relationship to people who are going to be passing through and moving north? Because you're not going to be able to live. You know, there's a question of whether the, the tropical rainforests will survive. There's a lot of science associated with that. Um, the reason the tropical rainforests survive is because it rains every day. But the reason that it rains is because the trees put out this stuff called dimethyl sulfide, which is a cloud condensation nuclei. And so what happens is it evaporates, moves, you know, a couple of miles and rains again. And then it evaporates, moves a couple of miles and rains again. So the rainforest does get watered literally every day. But we've been cutting huge swaths of that out and replacing it with species that don't put dimethyl sulfide out. So the tropical forests are so damaged that they may simply not be able to survive um, as things get hotter. They're, stre they're horribly stressed as it, as it is right now. So we may be talking about sand desert all the way up to where we're sitting right now recording this program. You know, I won't live to see it. You won't live to see it. You know, um, but you know, our our great 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 grandkids will, and um, you know, we're not leaving them a planet in particularly yeah. good shape. Yeah, if you care about your children and uh, and your neighbors, then we need to take action right now. Yeah, and yeah. and I think and you've given us some really good ideas for how to do that. Yeah, it's all I can offer. <laughs> Joe, thank you very much for, for this uh, illuminating explanation. I, I do hope that those who see this will take it to heart and, and think about what they can do. Yeah. If, if all that left you a bit overwhelmed, remember there is a garden waiting to remind you how beautiful life can be. See you next week. <laughs>